The defense rests in the uh, Trump case in New York. The defense in the Chad Day Bell case calls a pathologist to contradict the state's finding as to the cause of death. Sean Combs, well, he's a scumbag. A story about a woman who lied. And if you do this, you need to go to prison. A former major leaguer is arrested, not agreeing to help on a passenger plane, got somebody arrested, and our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Hi, lawyer. 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 Good day, everyone. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. Thanks for joining us. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't. Like if you do. Leave me a comment below. Hit that little bell for notifications. And remember to listen to us on any of your favorite podcasting apps. All right, let's get to it. May 21st, 2024. First on the docket, the defense has rested in the case of Donald Trump. All right. Now, obviously, no former president has ever been charged with anything, and he's been charged in what they refer to as the hush money trial, and the defense called just two witnesses. Now, the jury's been sent home, and they're not going to resume again until next Tuesday. Now, I don't know if this is like an East Coast thing, but does anybody conduct court at any given time? Where I practice, man, judges just roll right into it. We don't want to waste the jurors' time. Uh, those jury instructions should have been basically drafted already by the judge at this point. I just don't understand why we keep dragging this stuff out. Anyway, next week, Tuesday, closing arguments. I sure wish the judge would have made this case available to the public via audio or visual. Uh, truly would have been a sight to see. And if the former president is convicted or acquitted, then everybody would have the opportunity to hear and see the same evidence and not get it through the filter of people that are actually in the courtroom. Now, as you know, the former president has pled not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records for hiding an alleged $130,000 payment to Stormy Daniels to keep her quiet about an alleged affair uh, that took place before the 2016 election. Now, the judge prosecuting defense, like I said, they're going to have a, a, a charging conference where they're going to go over jury uh, instructions. The judge usually has a draft that's been provided by the prosecution. The defense will then submit their instructions. And this is really where cases get reversed. Uh, oftentimes, it's the judge fails to give certain instructions. So ultimately, this is the judge's responsibility. The judges try to push it to the defense but the judge is the one that finally approves all of the jury instructions. So we'll see how that uh, bodes for both parties next week when they're read aloud to the jury. Now, Judge Mershon said that he expects his instructions to last about an hour and uh, they will be uh, read to the jury next week. In addition, this afternoon, the judge may also rule on the uh, defense's motion to have the case dismissed. That's basically a renewed motion for judgment of acquittal after the defense has rested. Uh, it doesn't really change the legal standard, and what it really amounts to is just preserving the record that you say, hey, judge, I'm giving you one more opportunity to dismiss this case. Nobody expects that it's going to get dismissed. No way, no how, not with this judge. Now, some people have been calling the defense's decision to put up the attorney or one of the attorneys for uh, Mr. Cohen uh, a complete disaster. And that was this Bob Costello guy, because the defense was actually having a pretty good day. They had uh, Michael Cohen admit that he stole money from the uh, former president's company because he was uh, described as a self-help uh, method because he thought he was entitled to a little more pay. So he just took a little money off the top. Anyway, they called this Costello guy to say that, that uh, Michael Cohen was a liar, which had pretty much been established. Anyway, it got into kind of a uh, grudge match between uh, Mr. Costello and the Judge Mershon to one point where the judge had to clear the courtroom and admonish the witness outside the presence of the jury and everyone else in there. God, I hope that is going to be on the record. I would love to see or hear what the judge said. Um, and apparently there's talk, you know, there's always talk and rumors. We don't like to talk in rumors, but it's always interesting because it was stated that Costello was caused at the urging of the president. And a lot of people say, and I've talked about this before, um, I don't care if, if a client is the former president or uh, a homeless individual. The lawyers have to talk about to the client. There's only a couple of things that you control, whether you're going to take a guilty plea, 
or go to trial, whether you testify uh, uh, or not at trial, and you know whether you're going to hire uh, who your counsel is going to be. That's it. All the other decisions are and should be left to the ju- to the attorneys. And you should and would want to uh, listen to your attorney, but don't ever let your client trump you on decisions like that. Now, the jury heard from 22 witnesses. Uh, the prosecution called 20 and uh, the defense called two. So that took a little about two hours for the defense case. Not surprising because most of the evidence is going to come through the prosecution witnesses. The defense really got everything out of it. And the fact that the president didn't testify doesn't shock me at all. Frankly, uh, there's nothing good that could have come from him uh, testifying. And I'm sure the prosecution would have loved that as well. He's entered a plea of not guilty. The question is, has the prosecution proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt? Like I said, I'm not sure if this is an East Coast thing or what, but it seems like none of these trials go for a full day. I just completed in March, a turned out to be a four week trial. And we started at 8.30 every day. We had a 15 minute break before lunch. We did 35 to 45, 30 to 45 minutes for lunch, a mid afternoon break. And we went till five. And then the attorneys were there most nights until six or seven and one night until 9 p.m. to make sure that we kept the case moving forward and to make sure uh, that we didn't waste the jury's time. We were on a rocket docket to get that thing done. So I don't understand why these people think they have so much time to just take these cases so slowly. Next, the Chad Daybell case. The defense has called Dr. Kathy Raven. Now, she is a board-certified clinical and forensic pathologist and has worked in the area of forensic pathology for over 25 years. She obviously is a medical doctor and she went to medical school and became a forensic pathologist. She practices primarily in California. Now she does independent consulting and she's testified in some 300 cases. John Pryor asked the doctor about her conclusions uh, in this case regarding the autopsy. And now there's normally usually five matters of death, homicide, accident, suicide, undetermined, or natural. Dr. Raven reviewed Dr. Christensen's autopsy report from Utah, as well as photos, law enforcement investigation reports, and what have you. Um, And she also listened to Dr. Christensen's testimony. Now, Christensen said she paid close attention to Tammy's autopsy report, and she says it was a thorough autopsy, and there were nonspecific bruising on Tammy's body. Now, Mr. Pryor asked Dr. Raven um, what could have caused the bruises in the arms, and Raven said, it's unknown. Raven says there was no anatomical cause of the death for Tammy Daybell, meaning all of her organs appeared fine, and the toxicology reports was extensive, and nothing they tested for was positive, so it's very unlikely that she was, in fact, poisoned. Now, Mr. Pryor asked about the autopsy being done in December of 2019. Now, the signing of the report was some two years later, Pryor asked why there was such a gap between the autopsy when it was done and the ultimate findings being signed. Dr. Raven says that the toxicology testing can take a few months sometimes, and that's the only thing that she could think of that would have caused such a delay. Now, Dr. Raven determined that the cause of death by her analysis was the death should have been undetermined because there was nothing anatomically wrong with Tammy DeBell. Pryor asked, what about the bruises on Tammy's arm, contributing that to asphyxia? She says the bruises were nonspecific. Mr. Pryor then asked her if there was any damage to the neck or throat. Dr. Raven said no. Mr. Pryor asked about the difference between her report and Dr. Christensen's report, where he said that Dr. Christensen said asphyxia was the manner of death. She says there's nothing There's nothing that points to asphyxia, and she believes the cause of death should be classified as undetermined. John Pryor then asked the good doctor about what about seizures. Dr. Raven says there are different types of seizures, large, shaking, and convulsive. And with small seizures, people might stare into space, make repetitive motions. And uh, then the attorney asked about arrhythmia which is an electrical disturbance to the heart. Dr. Raven say you may not see anything at the time of the autopsy if someone dies from arrhythmia. So then Pryor asked, well, what about the cause of death? What led to her death? And she's, Dr. Raven says seizure, arrhythmia, and other things could have contributed. And she says no conclusive scientific evidence shows how Tammy Daybell died. So 
Is this going to be enough to raise reasonable doubt as it relates to the death of Tammy Daybell? Well, um, we'll have to wait and see. When you have one doctor saying it's asphyxia, the other doctor saying you can't tell, it's undetermined, is that reasonable doubt? We'll have to wait and see what the jury believes. Now, we did hear the other day from uh, the daughter of a Tad and uh, Chad testified as to her health issues and concerns that her mother had. And the jury will have to obviously consider all of that evidence in this particular case if they choose to do so. Regardless of what happens, let me tell you this. This is my opinion. John Pryor has tried a much better case than both of Lori Vallow's attorneys. They were pathetic. They didn't even put up a fight. I think they gave up when they said the uh, death penalty was taken off the table. They didn't care. They were pathetic. At least Pryor, at least he acts like he's cares and he's putting up a fight. Um, so he's truly been effective. He truly has. Now, whether he loses, we'll have to all find out together. He probably will. But the point is, he's done much, much better. Now, a little more news as it relates to the uh, Chad DeBell case. Do you remember the whole thing we had in March and April kind of deal where right before the trial, an attorney by the name of Terry Ratliff filed a motion purporting that he was going to intervene in the case on behalf of Chad Day Bell and then continue the jury trial. Well, there was a show cause hearing that took, to, took place. And um, at that hearing, the court determined that the filing was completely uh, violated Rule 11 and that the court was going to impose sanction. Rule 11 is basically, it was a frivolous motion. And the court determined that the appropriate sanction was the payment of attorney's fees incurred by the parties that had to deal with the motions and requested that the attorneys submit their fees. So the courts received those fees, and then the court made some findings of facts and conclusions of law. And they said that the court noted that on April 22nd, 2024, related to this matter, Terry Ratliff is a licensed attorney in the state of Idaho, and on March 29th at 11.42 p.m., Mr. Ratliff filed an air-riddled and frivolous pleading in the case. Mr. Ratliff held himself out as the attorney for defendant in the caption pleading and in his signature on both the pleading and the pleadings had that in the certificate of service. Mr. Ratliff is not and has never been the attorney for the defendant in this case, and the pleading falsely and materially misrepresented that fact. The pleading filed uh, by Mr. Ratliff required a response from the court, counsel, and all the parties on the eve of a significant major trial, and the pleading caused the parties to unnecessarily divert resources and time in responding and unnecessarily increase the cost of the litigation in this case. And then on April 18th, 2024, Mr. Ratliff was given a reasonable opportunity to respond and offer no plausible explanation for this misrepresentation that he was in fact the attorney for the defendant. So then the judge goes through a bunch of uh, rules and it says then, um, as a mean of broad compensatory award, attorney fees are a, uh, appropriate in this particular case. And he ordered attorney Ratliff to, uh, pay for his frivolous uh, filings. Mr. Pryor's hourly rate was $3.50 an hour. The uh, government's rate was at $65 an hour. And uh, they had each had about uh, almost three hours into it. So therefore, Mr. Ratliff is sanctioned and has to pay the attorneys in this particular case through the court. And uh, so he, Mr. Ratliff owes $1,228.75. So it just goes to show you those uh, drunken late night filings that attorneys may uh, <laughs> enter into. Guess what? Uh, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. Anyway, he has 30 days in which to uh, mail that uh, check directly to uh, Mr. Pryor, his 1050 bucks, which is probably more than he's actually getting paid for the entire trial for uh, Chad Daybell. Attorneys are held to a standard, ladies and gentlemen. You can't just file crap. Let's just keep it that way. All right, next on the docket, Sean Combs. That guy is a scumbag. All right, here's maybe something that we all can agree upon. Like I said, uh, Sean Combs or P. Diddy or whatever he calls himself these days, can we agree that he's just a dirtbag? All right, now we know that Sean Combs' homes, both in California and Florida, were raided for, you know, pot potential investigation into a sex trafficking ring. And um, some people, not me, but some people have uh, called Sean Combs the Jeffrey Epstein of the rap world. Now, of course, we'll give him the presumption of innocence and no charges have been filed. But we can talk about the video that has surfaced. 
right? This is the video that Sean Combs paid $50,000 to recover from a hotel in uh, California. I believe it was the Intercontinental Hotel. And it shows Sean Combs doing uh, not so nice things to his girlfriend, Cassandra Ventura. Now, the assault happened uh, beyond the statute of limitations, so he cannot be prosecuted. And I think most of us would agree that it's a little disturbing to watch Sean Combs in his bath towel beat a woman who's running down the hallway and basically gets hit as she's trying to get on the elevator and leave. And then he picks up all her stuff and, and takes, takes her back. Not a very nice guy. Mr. Combs, let me give you some word of advice. Never, ever hit a woman. You don't do it. You just don't do it. And Mr. Combs settled a lawsuit uh, just the day after Ms. Ventura filed a lawsuit against him. Now, Combs and his publicist, of course, called her out as a liar and said she was just seeking money through a blatant blackmail attempt. Ooh, and now the video comes out. And then Sean Combs goes onto social media and makes an apology and takes full responsibility. And he was going to, you know, sought counseling after all of this and what have you. Well, I think it's completely self-serving at this point because weird because I thought that um, she was a total liar. Uh, turns out maybe the liar is Sean Combs. Anyway, Combs has now several other cases pending against him with very similar allegations. Probably should have talked to his attorney before he took to social media to apologize because the fact that he lied um, is going to be devastating to his credibility, uh, not only to any future judge in the future, but potential jury. So Sean Combs, get your checkbook out and write some checks and then use whatever you have remaining to get yourself a lot of attorneys for upcoming criminal case. And this one's going to be really, really expensive because a lot of jurors are going to say, ooh, we got some bad evidence. Sounds expensive, that's for sure. And hey, your liberty, your freedom is at stake. Next on the docket, speaking of liars, any woman that does this, turns out to be false, needs to go to prison. So a man spent a month in prison after being accused of attempting to rape and kidnap a woman in a supermarket parking lot back in April. But there's just one problem. According to the district attorney, the accuser's story was completely made up, and she admitted as much to the cops when they confronted her on her story. Angelina Borzova Urmova, identified as a uh, resident in Pennsylvania was charged with lying about the alleged attack. Now, Uramova falsely accused Daniel Pearson of pulling her pants down and striking her outside a supermarket back on April 16th. Pearson went on to face felony charges and spent exactly 31 days behind bars before charges were dropped last Friday and he was set free. And the DA noting that neither surveillance footage nor Uramova's iPhone corroborated her cl her claims. Then as part of the investigation, the police collected and reviewed available surveillance video from multiple retailers in the area and um, checked everything out. Well, guess what? All false. Nothing corroborated her story. So the review led to the discovery of multiple inconsistencies and contradictory information of Uramova's account and um, determined that there was no attack in the parking lot. Prosecutor said that the police and the detectives uh, confronted Urmova and got her to admit that she fabricated the allegations. Urmova admitted she falsely accused Pearson because she had seen him before and believed him to be creepy. The uh, defendant said that uh, her uh, claimed injury stemmed from an incident in the day with her grandmother. Now, a photo lineup following the, the alleged incident, Urmova said she was 60% sure he was the suspect. Well, guess what? She just turned 20 years old. And if you lie like this, guess what? You need to go to prison. You don't make allegations like that and they're not true. I get it. Maybe there's question of fact. You have competing, but this was just completely 100% fabricated because you thought the guy was creepy and you would send somebody to prison for that. Now, that woman is sick. She needs help and she needs to get that help while she's in prison. Let me know what you think. And a big leaguer was arrested. A former Boston Red Sox pitcher, Austin Maddox, was arrested in Florida as part of an underage sting that took place by police. Now, Mr. Maddox was one of 27 people arrested at the multi-agency operation late last month. 
And um, they are, the men, the 29 of them, are all accused of soliciting sex over the internet from people who they believe were children. Now, the defense attorney for Mr. Maddox says he intends to fight the allegations against him and will enter a plea of not guilty should formal charges be filed. Now, obviously, we'll give everyone the presumption of innocence, but this is the one thing you should never do as a defense attorney and go out there and say, you're going to fight this case and you're going to and your client's innocent. You don't have the discovery yet. Why would you do that? You're going to have to eat some crow here in a minute. Now, like I said, I don't know what happened, why Mr. Maddox showed up where he thought he was going to engage in some sort of sexual contact with someone under the age of 14, but I don't think that happened by accident. But maybe that's just me. Maybe I've handled just one too many of these cases, perhaps, over the years. Nobody shows up to those things unless they are intending to be there. Anyway, like I said, he... um, Mr. Maddox agreed, allegedly, to meet the girl at a prearranged location where guess who was on the other side? Not a 14-year-old girl, but law enforcement. Anyway, as you can see, he was taken down uh, by the police when he uh, tried to open the door. Anyway, he is charged with four felony counts, including traveling to meet after using a computer to solicit a child, and uh, he is being held in jail on a $300,000 bond. Now, I'm guessing he's going to stay there. Why? Because although Mr. Maddox was classified as a big leaguer and that made all the headlines, guess what? He played college ball for the University of Florida and was drafted by the Boston Red Sox in 2012. He spent about three months on the Red Sox roster before he got sent back down to the minors. He was released in 2019. So my guess is he doesn't have $300,000 to post for his bond. Next, don't want to help? Get arrested on an airplane. And okay, I'm okay with this. So a Frontier Airlines passenger was arrested after refusing to deplane following an argument with a flight attendant over following exit row instructions. Take a look at this video. Everyone aboard the flight um, at the North Carolina Charlotte Douglas International Airport was forced to deplane before takeoff during the chaos, which was filmed by somebody that's put it up on TikTok. The footage starts with an unidentified woman engaging in a back and forth with a flight attendant And at one point, asking the flight crew member, what is the problem? The woman then told the flight attendant that she was wasting her breath. And then the crew member walked away. The video then cuts to the woman, who was sitting with two other passengers, getting into a verbal altercation with another flight crew member after it appeared that she was being asked to exit the plane. And then over the public address system, the pilot came on and said, hey, really sorry, flight's going to be delayed. Um... Because guess what? We're going to wait until law enforcement arrives. The video then jumps again to the third staffer who works for Frontier at the airport, asking the woman to exit the plane to no no avail. She then said that she was calling her lawyer and that she needed to reach out for her young grandson in Texas. Another clip shows one of the pilots confronting the passenger and encouraging her just to get off the plane. Are you arresting me? She exclaimed. What crime did I commit? Anyway, the video goes on to explain how the woman said that she wasn't going to save anybody and was going to worry about herself first. Because, you know, when you sit in the exit row, they ask, are you willing to assist in the evacuation of a plane in case of an, an emergency? And they go, yes, yes, yes. And she said no. And if she doesn't want to move out of the seat, guess what? You're going to go to jail. <laughs> and I'm okay with this. Having handled many cases over the years for interference with a flight crew, your flight crew has to get you there safely. And if you can't follow their simple rules, and they are simple so that that plane and the passengers can all get there safely, get off the plane. Okay. Now, in all candor, I hate Frontier. Okay. Worst airline ever, ever, ever. They used to be good. Then they went to crap. Um, But you got to follow their rules regardless of uh, which airline you're you're on. And um, if you can't follow the rules, I'm telling you, this is why, (laughs) well, we'll just leave it at that. We'll just leave it at that. Commercial air travel has become the bus travel of the uh, 70s and 80s, ladies and gentlemen. It truly has. And finally today, our dumb criminal of the day. Yes, a man was arrested after he stole a police car following a rollover crash. Okay, set the scene. You have police arrive at a rollover crash, 
and uh, they observed Mr. Johnny Lott disturbing items related to the investigation, the car that rolled over. Anyway, according to the police report, Mr. Lott had picked up a pair of sunglasses that were on the ground, and the officer told Mr. Lott, hey, those belong to the owner of the car that was involved in the accident, and you need to put them back on the ground. Well, Mr. Lott apparently complied and continued to walk across the street, but then another officer saw Mr. Lott picking up a small socket wrench from the ground, and he was again advised that that item belonged to somebody involved in the crash, and he needed to put it down. Well, Mr. Lott then complied, but then he walked towards the officer's car, got in, and fled the scene. Turned on the lights, causing bystanders and other drivers to believe that it was an actual police car operating in case of emergency. Well, eventually, Mr. Lott lost control of the car and crashed into a fence. He was arrested and charged with grand theft of a motor vehicle, grand theft of law enforcement equipment, and resisting arrest without violence. Mr. Lott is in custody on a $5,500 bond. He should have picked up a few bucks while he was picking up items at the crash site. Anyway, Mr. Lott, you are our dumb criminal of the day. I mean, looting is bad enough, but looting after a rollover accident, that's just dumb. Anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, we'll see you tonight, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, live. We'll immediately do our Patreon show after that. And remember, the Constitution matters. Mm -hmm.